Hey there, welcome to week four. My name is Kyle. You probably have been joining us for three weeks now, uh, or maybe you just joined a group. If that is you, man, you picked a good week to join. Now, we're going to talk about some tough stuff as we've been talking about since last week, and we hope you'll really enjoy the conversation. It'll be challenging, but I, I want to do a couple things up front that I've been doing a version of every week. The first is to, to reiterate that all people need love, and we need to do all we can to love them well. And that probably starts with you and your small group first. Today, you might have some challenges around the topics. Maybe it was challenging last week. Maybe it's been challenging every week. I'm not sure. But I hope you have great, difficult conversations with love and compassion and truth. So I want to I want to make sure that we have that as our background. That we we're not going to always agree on everything theologically or relationally or emotionally, but we can agree. Doesn't matter what your belief system is that all people need love and we need to do all we can to love them well. I pray that you have compassion and grace for the people in your small group, for the people you'll talk with, for the people who you're thinking of. And maybe as you come out of these conversations, you'll be emboldened with compassion and grace to have great conversations uh, with the people who these topics impact. Or maybe they'll talk with you and now you'll have practiced some difficult conversations and will be super helpful. So we talked about perspective being redefined. We talked about singleness and marriage being redefined. We talked about sexual orientation, homosexuality, and heterosexuality last week. And today we're going to talk about gender redefined. Now, this is a polarizing topic just like the other ones, but because it is so new, um, there is a lot of barriers for us to be able to talk about this in the first place. And one of the things I recommend if you are in a small group and you're watching this content is to really go through the terms that I gave you in the initial part of the book because understanding what terms mean and what their usage is, is so important in terms of having a great conversation with someone. If you don't know the language, then it's really hard. Uh, to kind of give you a silly example, my son plays a lot of video games and he's not quite a programmer, but he's starting to use some language that I don't really understand what it means. So, so sometimes he'll say a word and I will think that word means something different than it does and I'll use it in a way um, that is, is not correct and you know he laughs and we have a good time. But when that word means something pivotal to someone, when they, when they choose it to mean a facet of their life or a part of their identity, and we don't know what that means, they can not feel seen and not be heard. So that part can be challenging. So I highly recommend you go through and look at all of the terms that I gave you. That way we're all speaking the same language. So on the topic of gender. So gender is, is one of those things that's actually very clear in Scripture. It is conclusive but not comprehensive. And what I mean by that is God clearly has made two genders. In, in Genesis 1, it talks about how God made them male and female. And God could have chosen to make human beings in any way, shape, or form he would like. He could have chosen multiple genders beyond two. He could have chosen one. He could have chosen any sort of way to make human beings reflect his image. And he chose to make them male and female. There are two options there. And he also chose those genders to fit together, not only physically, but emotionally and relationally, that each gender brings to a relationship and to a community something unique. And this doesn't always mean sexually. This means that as a male and a female are friends, or as they work together, or as their brothers and sisters in Christ, they have something that the other one needs because God has created both of them unique. Both of them bring something to the table. So God has created two genders, male and female, and both of them are good. When he put them together, he said, it's not good for a man to be alone, but now that they have one another, it's good. And God's creation was good. Now, the reason that's so important, because shortly after God made his creation, Adam and Eve, his first two people, sinned, and it brought sin into the world. It made not only them, but all of creation suffer at the hands of sin. Scripture is very clear about that. The Apostle Paul says all of creation groans to be restored. When Jesus comes on the scene, he says he will restore the earth to its former uh, glory, that he will give people new bodies, that he will give them a life without sin, and that death was never a part of his creation. And the reason that is important is that as sin entered our world, it entered our minds, it entered all of creation, it entered our personality, it entered our bodies. And the reason that's so important is because you and I don't work exactly 
as we're supposed to. You and I don't work the way God originally intended. Sin has twisted and warped our view of ourselves, our view of the world, our view of God, our compassion and grace for one another. And that's important because as we talk about uh, this idea of transgenderism, you know, one of the things that's really challenging to talk about is some people go, man, am I born this way? Is it my choice? And those two are really, really important topics. And honestly, I can't debate that. You could make a case for both of them, that someone says, hey, I'm born this way, it's not my choice. And another person says, I have chosen this. Which one honors God? Do they both honor God? Do neither of them honor God? So that part is challenging in and of itself. And honestly, I don't know the answer. I don't know if people are born um, wanting to be a different gender or wanting to be the gender they are or if they choose. But the really interesting thing is, it actually doesn't matter. Neither of those things matter for this very simple reason. You know, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he, he had sat down with him and Nicodemus visited him at night. And Nicodemus asked him about eternal life and how he had to inherit it. And Jesus says something very interesting to him. He says, you must be born again. You have to be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand what he's talking about. He's like, hey, how can you go through the birthing process again? I'm an adult. How is that possible? And Jesus says, that's not what I'm talking about. You must be born of water and of spirit. You must, if you give your life to me, change the way you see the entire world, including every facet about yourself. Which means every person who has ever been born has been born wrong. All of us have to be reborn in Christ. It doesn't matter if you are just born or if you're 80 years old. If you are not born again in Christ, all of us are born wrong. It's not the way God intended us. No one comes out into the world perfectly as God intended them because sin is in the world. So that's the first one, is that you and I need to be reborn which means we need to give our life over to Christ. And when we do that, He gives our life back to us and helps us see how we're supposed to see ourselves, our minds, our bodies, and even our gender. So that's the first one. All of us are born wrong, and only Christ can make us right by being reborn in Him. Now, the second one is, how do we deal with these issues of whether or not we can choose to be a male or a female? Now, if God has given you a gender, um, that that has most likely happened at at conception. It's not something that we choose to have. And I want to make sure to parse off two things here. One is that transgenderism in adults, and the other is in kids. And I want to deal with both of them. Let's deal with the adult one first. So if you're an adult and you feel like you're not in the right body, and you feel like God has said you are supposed to be this other gender. This is something that you're going to have to wrestle with. And, and I would say a few things, and maybe some of these things will be offensive to you or maybe offensive to the people um, that, that you have these conversations with. Is one, I don't think God has put the right minds in the wrong bodies or vice versa. Now, the reason this is important also is that I don't think God makes mistakes, but because we do live in a sinful world, because sin permeates not only us, but our entirety of of the cosmos, including us at the genetic level, it's very possible that either our minds or our bodies or our emotions or our thoughts, they, they lean towards something that God hadn't intended. And again, I don't mean that to be offensive, but it's very possible that you and I, we want something that God never intended for us. Now, there are people who are born with different sets of chromosomes. Some people are born with both. Some people don't develop in a certain way. And I'm not talking about those people because we understand that the human body and the human mind and every part of us, it can be altered and warped. Because we live in a fallen world, our genetics don't work exactly how they should. But most of the time, most of the time, not every time, most of the time, people are born with one gender. And so this movement about whether or not we can choose our gender, it it can often mean that did God make a mistake or is it important for us to get our gender right? And I want to say this, uh, a couple of different things. Well, first is getting your gender right is not the greatest indicator of who you are. It's not. And getting your gender wrong isn't the greatest threat 
to your identity. Neither of those is the most important thing about you. Now, we're kind of slipping in uh, to this idea of gender dysphoria, which is not only something that happens in our minds, but something that affects someone to the degree that they feel like they have the wrong mind or the wrong identity in the wrong body. And if that's you or if that's someone you know, I hope you'll get counseling. I hope you'll talk with someone who loves you. And if that happens to someone who you know and love, be compassionate, be caring, talk with them, listen, continue to point them to Christ, and hear their story. There may be a reason they're thinking that way, and maybe you can help them out. But if not, they're made in the image of God. They're loved by Him, and it is our job to love them well because all people need love, and we need to do all we can to love them well. So if someone is experiencing gender dysphoria, there's a few things that we can help them understand. Getting their gender right isn't the most important part about them. Getting their relationship with Christ right, that's the most important. And the other one that I mentioned is that getting your gender wrong is not the greatest threat to our identity. Getting our relationship with God wrong is the greatest threat to our identity. If we don't realize that we are sinful human beings, regardless of how we choose to identify ourselves, everything will be wrong in our life. So we gotta get that right. Relationship with Christ and our identity without Christ as sinful human beings. So that's really important. Now, to, to segment off a little bit to kids is, you know, we believe that kids don't have the capacity or the ability to be able to choose for themselves until they get to a certain age. Now, I don't know what that age is. I don't know what honestly makes an adult. In some cultures around, you know, the world, sometimes it's an age. It may be 18 for the United States. For some people, it's when they go on their first hunt or the first time they they do something. And a lot of cultures have an adult ceremony. And we don't kind of have that, so I'm not sure when that is. But what I do know is that probably before the age of 18, most people are not considered adults. They're still developing. They still need help from parents and people who love them well. And perhaps the strongest language I can use, and again, my desire is not to be offensive, but to be clear, because I think clarity helps us love people well, is that kids shouldn't be allowed or encouraged or recommended to make massive changes in their life that they're not developmentally ready for. And as parents, we have to have the guts and we have to have the compassion and the clarity to tell our kids, you are a boy because God made you that way. You are a girl because God made you that way. And we have to have the courage to tell them, you don't have to change anything because God loves you. We affirm their gender. We affirm how God has made them and we point them to Christ because we wouldn't allow our kids to make major life decisions without us. We wouldn't allow them to drive a car or to choose when they can drink. We wouldn't allow them to do something very dangerous. We protect them from those things, which means as parents, we must protect them from choosing to have an identity that God did not intend for them. Now, I know there's a lot to unpack here, and you probably didn't like some of the stuff that I said. That is okay. I totally get that. But my hope is you'll have grace and compassion for me as I did this recap. I hope you'll have grace and compassion for one another because you may disagree. And I hope you'll love one another well, even as you try to point each other to Christ and love people well uh, as they're going through anything. Thank you so much. Thank you.